Hi, and welcome to the Literature Lab, where you learn to read texts and write arguments like a literary critic. That means you read for details, quote texts with integrity, develop ideas into arguments, and use the right language. I'm Michael Elliott from the Department of English at the University of Calgary. In the last video, we learned how to move from reading a text to writing about it through the four stages of annotating, thinking, filtering, and summarizing. You annotate in order to gather quotations from the text, and these quotations are the evidence that make your argument convincing. In this video, you'll learn how and why to quote other people's writing in your writing. But first, there are two categories of texts that most students of English literature will quote, primary texts and secondary texts. Primary texts are things like novels, plays, or poetry like Dylan Thomas's In My Craft or Sullen Art, the poem we analyzed in the last video. Secondary texts are the kinds of writing you're producing. Essays, articles, introductions, lectures, summaries, any interpretive writing that's about a primary text. And yes, that includes Wikipedia entries, Cliff's Notes, any writing you find online or in print. When you use its ideas in any way, you need to say so. This video focuses on quoting primary texts. When, why, and how. We've all heard this in an English class. Hey, that's just my interpretation. You can disagree, but we're all just sharing equally valid opinions anyway, right? No, that's not right. In fact, you're wrong. All interpretations of text are not equally valid. Some are just plain wrong. Why? Because they ignore their responsibility to look at the words on the page, to make an argument that's based on evidence. You can try to argue that The Great Gatsby is about a secret alien cabal running New York, or Hamlet is about dental hygiene, but you'll fail. Words on the page are the facts we have in common, and we ignore them at our peril. It's true that in literary analysis, there's no absolute right or wrong the way there is in, say, math, but that doesn't mean everything's merely subjective opinion. There are well-argued and badly-argued interpretations. And the difference comes down to textual evidence. So if you're making arguments about literature, you'll need to quote that evidence and do it effectively. To review, evidence equals quotations. And you need to use evidence effectively. So what does effective mean? You have to interpret evidence in ways that make it clear to readers how it's doing what you claim it's doing. Don't leave evidence to speak for itself. If paraphrasing or summarizing your quotations would achieve the same effect, then you should be doing that. Whenever you quote a text, you have a duty to show that the author's words can say or do what your words can't. Show how the author has made deliberate choices and what their effects are. Otherwise, why quote those words when you could just use your own? So I've got good news and bad news. The good news is that effective interpretation is a pretty simple formula. Interpretations need quotes, and quotes need interpretation. But the bad news is that it's harder to do it than to say it. You can only interpret a text effectively when you quote its words, but you should only quote words when you're ready to interpret them. So when and how should you quote a text? The answer is whenever you need to support your argument with evidence. Generally speaking, that's whenever you say something that would be more convincing if you were to show, not just tell. Like if you say, for example, that a character is conflicted or a poem uses a lot of cloud images. Quote a text when its words are doing something that only they can do, like revealing character conflicts or using cloud images. The good rule of thumb. Every body paragraph should have some textual evidence. It validates your claims and suggests that they're based on specific words and not just vague general impressions. 
But there's just one more small piece of bad news. Quotes need interpretation, but they also need citation. You need to document where the quotation comes from. In the next part of this video, you'll learn how to uphold academic integrity when you quote texts. Integrity means many things. They all pertain to how trustworthy you are. Is your work the product of your own mind and abilities? If other people have contributed to it, have you drawn a clear red line between your work and theirs? In English literature courses, academic integrity means that your words and ideas and other people's words and ideas are clearly distinct categories. So, let's turn now to how citations help you make that distinction. There are two ways you'll use other people's writing in your writing. One is directly quoting their words, and the other is paraphrasing their ideas. Both of them require you to cite your sources, but in different ways. In this part of today's video, you'll learn how to cite them. The conventional format for citing quotations is called MLA, which stands for the Modern Language Association that came up with these rules. We're not covering all the MLA rules in this video. You can learn them for yourself by searching online for the terms MLA style or MLA format, or by following the links in the notes below this video. We'll use MLA format to cite sources in this video, but remember, other disciplines use other conventions. Let's start with direct quotations. Our example will be this novel, Kazuo Ishiguro's The Remains of the Day. On this page, 185, the housekeeper of an English country estate confronts the butler, Mr. Stevens, for repressing his feelings. It's kind of a theme. Say you want to quote a line from this page. You need to tell readers where that line appears so they could retrace your footsteps and see it for themselves. You could do it this way, which feels clumsy. But this sentence stumbles over unnecessary details before it gets to the main point. Instead, let's make that citation unobtrusive. Notice a few features of this standard MLA format. The author's last name, Ishiguro, and the page number, 185, appear in parentheses at the end of the sentence, but before the closing period. Even though there's a period in the original, after alone, you move it to after the citation. Yes, it feels strange, but do it anyway. This citation is in parentheses and follows right after the closing quotation mark. You quote the page number 185 because this is prose, that is, a text whose form or page layout doesn't affect its meaning. Remember the Dylan Thomas poem from the last video? Because it's verse, not prose, its layout affects its meaning. The lengths of its lines and the words that end each line are important. If it were prose, it would look like this. The distinction between prose and verse matters for citations. If you were quoting the poem, the number in parentheses would refer not to the page number, but to the line number, as indicated by the letter L, like this. Notice how you don't need to mention Thomas in the citation because you mentioned him in the same sentence as the quotation. And if you're citing lines from a play, like this one from Shakespeare's King Lear, you include the act and scene numbers. Notice how you insert a slash at the end of one line before the next begins. Let's go back to the novel example. This number alone doesn't tell your reader which edition of Ishiguro's novel you're quoting from. It's been published in multiple countries multiple times. The man just won the Nobel Prize for Literature, and this novel was made into a movie, so let's just say there's more than one edition. So how might we do that? Here's one possibility. This is clumsier than ever. Imagine if we had to do that every time we quoted the novel. There is a better way. The MLA says to put those details in a list called the works cited at the end of your essay. Look at the reverse side of the title page where the fine print is. Find two pieces of information, the name of the publisher and the year it was published. 
Remember, you're telling the reader which edition of the book you're quoting, so they can read it for themselves. At the top, you see that this edition was published in 2014. That's the year we want. Further down, you see that it was published in Canada by Vintage Canada. And that's everything you need for your Works Cited entry. The MLA says to format list entries that way and to alphabetize them by the author's surname. So far, all the examples you've seen draw a clear line between your words and the text's words. That's important, so your reader knows where one ends and the other begins. But there are two higher level skills you should develop now, integrating quotations and paraphrasing them. Consider our example from Shakespeare again. This works, but all it does is insert a quotation between some transition words, Gloucester laments, and a citation. That's just fine for a first draft when we're gathering evidence and using it to illustrate arguments, like this. But the transition still feels abrupt. We can smooth it out a little if we integrate Gloucester's words into a new sentence that we write ourselves, like this. You lose a bit of the poetry, the simile in line 37, but gain two things, brevity and your reader's confidence that you're quoting just the important parts of those lines. Notice how the parenthetical citation still goes at the end of the sentence, but because we've split the quotation into two halves, we add a comma between their line numbers 37 and 38. Remember how you learn to quote words only when you're ready to interpret them? Leaving out the simile in line 37 means you don't need to discuss it. Sometimes the author's exact words matter to your argument, but sometimes you just need to convey the general idea, and that is when you paraphrase or rewrite the author's words in your own words. You still need to tell readers where those original words are, even when you're not quoting them, like this. Paraphrasing is also very common when you're using words and ideas from secondary sources to make your argument. You need to cite them every time you use them, so readers always know where your ideas end and theirs begin. And that brings us to part three of this video. Let me ask you a question. Do you own any media that you didn't pay for? You don't have to answer that question. Just think about what's on your computer and on your phone. It's easy for us to get media that aren't legitimately ours, which is a problem for the artists. But a much bigger problem is pretending that we are the artists. It's one thing for you to play Rihanna on your phone. It's another thing altogether for you to tell me that you and your friends recorded that song in your garage. Rihanna earns royalties for her work just like you earn grades for your work. That's the difference between copying and pasting words from a source into your essay and passing those words off as your own, as if you wrote them. You know you didn't. It's utterly obvious to your readers that you didn't, so why pretend you did? You're not fooling anybody. You just look ridiculous. And more importantly, you've erased the red line between your work and their work. Sometimes we make mistakes. We read a Wikipedia article and carelessly transcribe its wording and ideas into our essay. We copy and paste sentences from an article or summary into an essay and forget to document where those words came from. We're working toward a deadline and we don't have time to disentangle our writing from our sources. But here's the problem. Intentions don't matter. Results matter. Whether you're violating academic integrity on purpose or by accident, the consequences are identical. They vary from a failing grade on the assignment or in the course to a suspension to an expulsion. Much depends on your record and your institutional policies as well as the extent of your breach. So why does it matter? Because if anyone's getting paid for that song, it should be Rihanna, not you. Similarly, if you're getting credit for writing an essay and passing a course and getting a degree for writing an essay, 
That essay has to be your work, or you don't deserve credit for it. So that's the how, when, and why of quoting other people's writing in your writing. To interpret persuasively, you need to quote. To earn credibility and credit, you need to cite. Thanks for watching this third video in our series. To see future installments, you can follow this YouTube channel or follow me on Twitter at U-L-L-Y-O-T. This is Michael Elliott from the Department of English at the University of Calgary, signing off.